You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, Episode 12, Sonnet 11. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if, if I, I say I'm not, not just another no. one in your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if, if I, I say I will never, never surrender? Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions and, as importantly, for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. Please keep your suggestions and criticism coming. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 11. As fast as thou shalt wane, so fast thou growest, in one of thine from that which thou departest, and that fresh blood which youngly thou bestowest, thou mayst call thine when thou from youth convertest. In addition to rapid and quickly, in Old English fast meant firm, fixed, constant, watertight, enclosed and fortified, and related to the noun fasten, meaning fortress, cloister, enclosure or prison. This ties into the trenches image from Sonnet 2 and Sonnet 5's sap, and Sonnet 5's liquid prisoner. The word wane meant to make or become smaller gradually, diminish, decline, fade, and in addition to its use to describe the phases of the moon, it also describes a ship leaving for the horizon as seen from the shore. This is strengthened by the following lines, departest, which recalls the dedication and sonnet 6 where the adventurer, the sonnet sequence, is setting forth on its journey. I find it interesting that it was only in the early 15th century that the word wax was replaced with grow, and the sense of waxing and waning would have invoked the phases of the moon as that use was already in circulation from the 1300s. This is important, which we'll see when we get to the following quatrain. As I discussed when analyzing sonnets 1 and 2, ink is the blood of the sonnets. The sonnets are written to capture Shakespeare's youth, and so it is the fresh blood of the poet that fuels them. Shakespeare can still call the sonnets ink his when he is old. Likewise, the fresh sonnets take ink away from the older ones, but still belong to their predecessors that they share the sequence with. To convert might also have meant a change or turn from one religion to another, but I'm quite confident that the intention here is to change into another form or substance or transmute. Shakespeare's youth is being converted into sonnets, where it will remain youthful. Herein lies wisdom, beauty, and increase. Without this folly, age, and cold decay. If all were minded so, the times should cease, and threescore year would make the world away. Folly comes from the French, meaning madness or stupidity. Herein contrasts with without. So wisdom, beauty, and increase, and legacy, live in the sonnet sequence, whereas folly, age, and cold decay continue outside of it. At the same time, the sonnets are able to live without the foolish madness of aging and decaying. Minded means remembered, perceived, to give heed to, as well as be of the same mind, and heed in Old English meant observe, to take care, attend, care for, protect, take charge of. If everyone were remembered like Shakespeare in his sonnets by being converted into poetry, or if all his sonnets were remembered, then all the visions of time would become irrelevant to the ever-living poetry that is represented by the rose's distillation that was discussed in Sonnet 5. Three score year refers to the age Shakespeare might have hoped to live, and might be related to the biblical three score and ten. But numbers and the passage of time are central to the sonnet sequence, and it's far more likely that it's a reference to sonnet 60, which runs parallel to sonnet 11 in a number of interesting ways. The relationship of the lunar phase in sonnet 11 to the tides in sonnet 60 was well established long before Shakespeare's time, so it's no surprise that he would use it to connect these two sonnets, especially in conjunction with the nautical sense of the word departure from the first quatrain that's qualified by would make the world away, where away originally meant from one's place or from one's possession, and in the 16th century acquired the additional meaning of onward in time. This reminds us of the dedication and foreshadows the word bark or ship in sonnets 80 and 116. 
The sonnet sequence is the ship that sails the seas of eternity, carrying its sonnet passengers to the reader. This kind of numerical referencing is no anomaly. There's a fair amount of referencing throughout the sequence, and I will try not to miss any when we get to them, but I'm pretty confident I won't catch a lot of them. Let those whom nature hath not made for store, harsh, featureless, and rude, barrenly perish. Look whom she best endowed, she gave them all, which bounteous gift thou shouldst in bounty cherish. Store takes us back to Sonnet two's treasure. Harsh, featureless, and rude are all very negative, as opposed to the beauty that Shakespeare is inscribing into the sequence. Shakespeare is expressing his right and intention to leave offensive or boring aspects of his character out of the sonnet sequence, to let them die along with him, so that his legacy can be free of blemishes. Endowed meant provided an income, in particular a marriage portion recalling the marriage contract from Sonnet 1. And she gave the more works with bounteous gift and bounty to recall Sonnet 4's discussion on usury and increasing wealth in order to pass it along to one's heirs. Cherish, from the old French cher, carried today's meanings of hold as dear, treat with tenderness and affection, as well as the implicit expensive. She carved thee for her seal, and meant thereby, thou shouldst print more, not let that copy die. Carve meant to cut, but also originally to write, meaning to write into stone. Seal comes from the old French meaning the seal on a letter, which in turn derives from the Latin word sigillum, which also meant small picture or engraved figure. The word seal is interesting because the image in the seal is a reflection, a reversed copy of the sigil, stamp, or signet ring. And here, each sonnet is being compared directly to the image that Shakespeare has stamped onto it. Moreover, Shakespeare is writing the sonnets to act as his seal, and it is their imprint in the reader that counts as a copy. The sonnets must imprint themselves in more readers, or the original copies will die. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording these podcasts, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support me at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. And please join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnet comics with an X. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not, not just another not one in your place? place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? Never.